through every age. The author of salvation, hope of every nation, high above the heavens, oh God, our praise. You are a mighty God, you are a mighty God, angels bow before you, heaven and earth adore you. You are a mighty God, you are a mighty God, crowned in all your glory. Holy Father to the fatherless, healer of our brokenness, a friend in all our loneliness, the breaker of shame. He came to rescue all the lost, the victor on the rugged cross, to roll the stone away for us, conquer the grave. You are a mighty God, you are a mighty God, angels bow before you, heaven and earth adore you. You are a mighty God, you are a mighty God, crowned in all your glory, only you are holy. Let the oceans roar, we will lift our voice, singing holy. Let the whole world sing of your majesty, you're the only king who is holy. Let the skies rejoice, let the oceans roar, we will lift our voice, singing holy. Let the whole world sing of your majesty. You're the only king who is holy, holy, holy. You are a mighty God. You are a mighty God. Angels bow before you. Heaven and earth adore you. God, you are a mighty God, crowned in all your glory, only you are holy. You are a mighty God, you are a mighty God, angels bow before you, heaven and earth adore you. You are a mighty God, you are a mighty God, crowned in all your glory, only you are holy. Good morning, Milton Bible Church. Good morning. So glad to have you all here with us. Um, it's going to be a wonderful morning as we celebrate God, as we worship together, and as we have baptisms. It's going to be exciting. If I can just ask one favor this morning, because of the baptisms, we have a lot of family and friends. I think we're going to be quite packed. So please fill up the middle of the rows and maybe leave the outside so latecomers will have a place to sit. We're so glad that you're here with us. At Milton Bible Church, we invite the body of Christ to come and share if God has spoken to you. We want the body to speak to the body, to edify and encourage. If God has laid something on your heart this morning, if you're a regular at NBC, please come up and see me. I'll be sitting right here. And we'd love to have you share uh, a word of testimony of faith, of a scripture God has spoken to you, something to edify the body. So we would love to hear from you. Let's pray this morning as we open up in worship. Ephesians 1 says... Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Father, you are blessed. You are honored, God. We are here this morning to honor you and to glorify you. You are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You are worthy to be praised, God. I just pray this morning, Lord, as we enter in worship, that we lay before you our, our cares, our concerns, our burdens that we brought to you this morning, Lord, that we brought here this morning that are very real, but we lay them at your feet, Jesus. We know that you can carry what you what we can carry. Lord, you are much stronger than we can. We lay them at your feet, and we worship you because you are worthy to be glorified and to be honored. Be blessed this morning, Lord. We praise you. Amen. Oh, 
precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. I am washed, I am washed, I am drenched in love. The lamb, I'm not a slave to what would help me damp. How beautiful that cleansing flood. I am washed, I am washed, I am drenched in love. Sing, oh precious. And oh precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Washed, I am washed, I am drenched in love. Oh, fill me deep in that crimson sea. I'm not ashamed of what will shackle me. How infinite that grace divine. I am free, I am free, I am a child of God. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. I am washed, I am washed, I am drenched in love. This, how precious there's power in the blood of Jesus. How priceless, how precious there's power in the blood of Jesus. How priceless, how precious there's power in the blood of Jesus. How priceless, how precious. There's power to the blood. I was buried deep with Christ my Lord. Now I'm raised to life forevermore. My name's been carved upon your heart. No, not dead. No, not hell could ever rip us apart. And oh, precious is the flow. No other fount I know. I am washed, I am washed, I am drenched in love. I'm washed, I am washed, I am drenched in love. I am washed, I am washed, I am drenched in love.
I trust Him. How I proved Him o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to Amen, amen. Well, it is so good to trust in Jesus. Is that right? Amen. Amen. Let me just pray for us before we sit down. Lord Jesus, we're so thankful that we can be here today, God. Uh, It is so sweet to trust in you, and that's why we're here, Jesus, to worship you, God. You've spoken to us already in our worship time, God, and we're excited, Jesus, for what you have to say in the baptisms, in the message today, and all the ways that you're working in our lives. Would you come and meet us today, Jesus? We love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. You can go ahead and grab a seat. Well, today is a pretty exciting Sunday. I mean, every single Sunday at Milton Bible Church is exciting. I like to say everything's exciting, so, you know, if you've heard me speak long enough, I'm always excited. But I'm excited today because we've got a baptism service on our hands. We've got a baptism service on our hands. We have two, I want to say kids, but really we have a young man and a young woman 
We have uh, Millie Spiro. And we have Victor Manu. We were working on that, weren't we, uh, Moses? Right? Uh, getting baptized today. And I think you're just going to be so blown away by their testimony and by their faith. But it is baptism. So what's baptism all about? Well, this is a bit of an old analogy, but I think it's a helpful one. Often uh, we can think of baptism kind of like a wedding ring. You know, this wedding ring does not make me married. I wear this wedding ring uh, because I love my wife and I want to show my commitment to her. But really what it is, it's a symbol of my love and affection and devotion to my wife, Wendy. And once in a while, we'll sometimes, you know, forget to put it on in the morning, and Wendy will say, oh, I forgot to put my wedding ring on, right? And it's not like she's calling me to say, we're not married anymore, or something like that, right? But she's just disappointed because she wanted to have it on that day, and I've done the same thing. Well, that's like what baptism's all about. Baptism doesn't save us. It's not our salvation. We are saved when we profess our faith in Jesus Christ. We invite him into our heart and into our life, and in that moment, he comes in. But baptism, kind of like a wedding ring, it's a symbol of an inward confession. It's a symbol of our love for Jesus. And when we're baptized, we're publicly proclaiming, I love Jesus. I'm with Jesus. I'm with him. And so we're so excited for Millie and for Victor and this uh, decision they've made in obedience to be baptized with Jesus. This is what baptism is all about. The Apostle Paul says in Romans 6, Do you not know that all of us who've been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, um, with him by baptism into death in order that as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. And that's what it's all about today. So I asked uh, Millie, I said, ladies first, do you want to go first or do you want to uh, choose who gets to go first? And she said, I'm going to go first today, uh, Mark, Pastor Mark. So I'm going to invite Millie to come on up and she's going to share our testimony, her testimony with us. Uh, Matt, we're going to need that mic there. That's okay. So you go ahead, Millie. Hello everyone, my name is Millie, I'm 10 years old, and I'm super excited to be baptized today. Before I knew Christ, the most important thing in my life was myself. I would get really upset if I didn't get something I wanted, or get angry when someone was mean to me. Instead of thinking of what God wanted me to do, I would only think about what would make me, better, make me feel better in the moment, which would just make things worse. I grew up learning about God, but never really understood the purpose of prayer, and questioned if God really heard me when I prayed to him. Sometimes I wondered if he really cared about me and felt like some things might be too big of a problem for him. Christ changed my life on July 27, 2022. I was having a fight with my brother and was feeling really upset. My mom had us take a break from each other to cool down. After a few minutes, I was feeling very guilty of the way I treated my brother. And I knew it wasn't okay for me to respond the way that I did, even though I was upset. I, go, I chose to go say sorry to him and ask him f to forgive me, but I still felt like I was missing something and like I needed to talk to God. I decided to apologize to God and ask him to forgive me too. This was the first time I took time to truly apologize to God for something. That made me feel so joyful inside and, and, I, and I felt like all the weight from that problem was lifted off my shoulders. I knew then that I wanted, to, I wanted to make Christ first in my life and my top priority, and I prayed and gave him my whole heart. I came out right away and told my mom, then I ran across the street and told my Nana and Papa, then I called my dad. I told everyone else in my family as fast as I could. They all said it looked like I was glowing. And now, with Christ in my life, I am so thankful, and I love praying to him whenever I can, especially when I feel upset or anxious. You know how if you go on the Bruce Trail, there are those white markers that guide you along the right path? To me, Jesus in my life is like those trail markers showing me the way, but he's also like my hiking buddy who is with me every step of the way, no matter what. I'm so thankful for his love, forgiveness, and grace. There are two verses that have meant a lot to me in my life. John 3, 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. 
And that's why I want to be baptized today. Millie, awesome job. Awesome job. I don't think, yeah, you can, well, one second. I was going to say, I don't think I'll ever hike the Bruce Trail without seeing Jesus on those markers and being reminded of my hiking buddy. So thanks. That was an awesome testimony and a great reminder and encouragement. So go ahead. You can get in the tank there. I know we have lots of family and friends here today with Millie, so welcome. We're so glad you're here with us. Yep, you can get down. All right. So Millie, have you professed faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Yes. And it, is it your intention to follow him all the days of your life? Yes. All right. Then on the profession of your faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father, of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All right. Let's give her a big hand. Congratulations. Woohoo! Congratulations, Millie. It's fantastic. Victor, my friend, it's your turn. Come on up. All right, Victor, the mic is yours. Hey, church. Um, before I accepted Jesus to my heart, I didn't really know what it meant to be a follower of Christ. But my parents always told me that God loved me, and he desired for me to become friends with him. Through going to church and studying the Bible at home, I knew that Jesus had died for me and God's will for my life was to believe and invite Jesus into my life. One day, when I was six years old, I decided to open my heart to him. So I asked my dad to pray for me so I could receive Jesus into my heart. We prayed together and I immediately felt peace and joy in my heart. It was very easy. As a young believer, I tried my best to study the Bible and talk with God through prayer. I like to pray because I, because I get to be alone with God and talk to him about my needs, worries, and concern, concerns without always relying on my parents to pray for me. I don't always do a great job at this, but I know that God is always there for me and nothing will ever change about his love for me. I also like hanging out with my friends who love Jesus. We can encourage each other and help each other out. This summer, I went to an overnight Christian camp in Muskoka and got to meet other kids who love Jesus. We prayed every day until we lost our voices. It's so much fun hanging out with God's children. Another thing I really enjoy is reading the Bible and memorizing Bible verses. Some of my favorite verses are Romans 1.16. It says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. What this verse means is to me is that I do not have to be ashamed or afraid of knowing Christ and telling others about him freely. I like this verse because it challenges me not to be ashamed of sharing my faith. Another verse I like is 2 Timothy 1.7. It says, For the God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and self-discipline. This one tells me God has already given me power. I need to go through life without being afraid of anything or anyone, but loving others as God has loved me and forgiven my sins. In Mark 16, 16, Jesus says, anyone, believe, anyone who believes and is baptized will be saved. I decided to get baptized today to deepen my faith in Jesus. I know God has great plans for my life, and getting baptized today is in our profession of my faith to follow him and trust him fully. Thank you. All right. Great job, Victor. Come on over. Yeah, you can get in there. Really enjoyed your testimony. Did you know in the early church they had to do 40 days of classes to be baptized? Yeah, so we don't do that at Milton Bible Church, but good thing, right? All right, so Victor, my friend, have you placed your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Yes. And is it your uh, intention to follow him as your Lord and Savior all the days of your life? Yes. Awesome. On the profession of your faith, I baptize you now in the name of the Father, of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Congratulations. Let's give him a big hand. You did it, buddy. Congrats. All right. Victor, I got your flip-flops here. I got your flip-flops. Don't forget these. All right. Before I hand it over to Matt, I just want to say, uh, were you encouraged today by these testimonies? Having, uh, having been in uh, family ministries for many, many years, doing youth pastoring, kids pastoring, all that, 
I think, man, if our kids can do this, if our young men and young women can do this, we can all get baptized, right? And if you haven't had an ch- opportunity to take that step of obedience to be baptized, I really want to encourage you, come talk to me after. You can come talk to Matt. You can send us a message this week, but we would love to get you baptized. Not because uh, it's some exciting thing to do, not to just get you up in front of it, because that's what Jesus asks of us. Go into all the world, share the gospel, and baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So if uh, you haven't been baptized yet, come and do it. It's an act of obedience. If these kids can do it, so can you. All right, Matt, come on up. We're going to keep on going with our service today. Thanks, Mark. That was awesome, wasn't it? That's great. I was baptized just a little bit older than Victor and uh, Millie. I was probably 16 or 17. I remember it like it was yesterday. So as Mark said, please pray about that. No matter how old you are, if you have not been baptized and made that public profession, please, please do that. So we just have a couple of announcements. I just want to introduce myself again. My name is Freddie Mercury. Oh, just kidding. I'm... I'm doing Movember this month, and my wife is not quite so pleased with the mustache, but (laughs) someone else told me this morning they like it, so we'll see where we go from there. (laughs) My name is Matt Timpson. I'm one of the elders, uh, one of the leaders here at Milton Bible Church. Uh, Welcome, everybody. If you are new here this morning, we especially welcome you, and a lot of friends and family, so there's a lot of new people, so thank you for joining us. Um, Just outside the door to the right, there's a Connect desk. There's a welcome team there, and they would love to say hi to you. There is a... um, uh, uh, what am I trying to say? A booklet and a little gift for you if you're new. So come and, come and take advantage of that. We'd love to get to know you better. Um, offering, we don't pass the plate around still. Our offering is there's a table just outside where you can do check or cash. You can give online at miltonbiblechurch.ca. So thank you so much for your faithfulness. Last Wednesday, we had our annual general meeting because we are incorporated. It was a vision and prayer night. It was awesome. We also looked over the budget and the finances. Sounds dull, right? You know what? It was a story of how God has been so faithful to us over the last couple of years and how he's continued to provide. And it's also a story of how you, Milton Bible Church, how faithful you've been in giving. So thank you for continuing to do that. Uh, So we have a couple of announcements. We're going to start with this coming next weekend is our Why Not Me conference. And Elijah, would you show the video that we have? Hey, Milton Bible Church family, Pastor Jim here. One of my earliest leadership lessons came from a guy named Terry, who was nearly twice my age. I was serving as a volunteer on the senior leadership team of our church, and we were going into a major building program. Well, at one of our senior leadership team meetings, the lead pastor came in and said that he had a desire to forego his raise that year, sacrifice it, and have it put into the building fund. The idea that he had was to let the church family know that as the leader of the church, he was willing to make this great sacrifice. Personally, I thought it was a great idea not to give the lead pastor a raise that year. The truth was we had no money in the bank anyway. Well, Terry turned to the pastor and he said, listen, you are gonna get your raise this year. Our job is to take care of you and your family. What you do with that money is between you and the Lord. We went through the meeting. After the meeting, I kind of uh, asked Terry if I could ask him a question. And, uh, and he said, absolutely. And I said, you know what, Terry? I still think that the pastor had a really good idea. And, uh, you know, why did you, um, you know, kind of turn the meeting a certain way? He said, do you know what, Jim? He said, it's always the right thing to do the right thing. And here's the deal. You never run scared when you run with God. You know what? I have never forgotten that leadership lesson. I've been through two building programs. We've purchased the building we're now in. And it's filled me, that one statement has filled me with confidence and faith. If you know God is in it, you don't have to be afraid. It's great to rub shoulders with other leaders, young leaders, older leaders, people who are growing in leadership, people who are just entering into leadership or exploring leadership, and people who are far ahead of you in leadership. Why Not Me Leadership Conference is a conference for all of us, all of us to grow and to learn and to rub shoulders and to move forward in God together to become all that God wants us to be. So register, come on out. Let's grow together in the Lord.
All right, so as Jim just said there, this conference is for everyone. It's called Why Not Me? So if you read that, that answers your question if it's for you. Come on out, we have a lot of people register and there's certainly room for more. Go on again to our website and you'll be able to register there. Um, two other things I just want to highlight. In two weeks from now, on uh, Sunday, November 27th, the ladies are doing a women's Christmas tea. There it is, all right, Regina. <laughs> Regina puts on a good party. Ladies, again, go to MiltonBibleChurch.ca, register, sign up, and come on out. On the 26th, on the Saturday, we'll be doing all our decorating, Christmas trees, etc. so the place will look nice and Christmassy for that day. Last thing, on Wednesday, November 23rd, we are doing prayer training. So we want to be able to train the people of God on our um, theology, model, and practice of prayer. You've noticed last Sunday we had two prayer teams on either side. We haven't done that since the beginning of COVID. And we reinstituted it last week, and it was wonderful. We had a number of people that came up and prayed. And what is it for? It's for God to, it's for you to have an opportunity to be prayed for, to be prayed for healing, to be prayed for fullness of the Spirit, anything that you would like. Um, but what the training is for is not just for that. It's like I said, to come out and learn how to pray. It's valuable for everybody, I believe. So if you're a leader here, if you're a connect group leader, if you're a ministry leader, it's for you. If you're on the prayer ministry team, or you think you might want to be on a prayer ministry team, come on out. Or if you just want to learn about prayer, come on out. You're not going to be committed to being on a team. It would just be great to, uh, um, uh, to learn more, how to more effectively pray for others. So that's on Wednesday the 23rd here at the Connect Center at 7 p.m. All right, that's all the announcements that I have. So lastly, we're going to dismiss our power kids to their program. And let me just pray for you guys, and then you can be dismissed. Father, thank you for um, each and every child here this morning, Lord. I thank you for those that are um, uh, taking their time to be with them this morning in the power kids programs and teach them and, and love on them. Father, today we saw two, as Mark said, two children, but they're now two young, uh, a young man and a young woman that... Uh, took this public profession of faith, Lord. It was so exciting. And I just pray, Father, that others uh, would be stirred in their Power Kids program this morning to maybe do the same. Thank you, Father. Bless them as they go off to their program. Amen. Amen. Okay, kids, you can head on out. Uh, Pastor Mark can come up. He's going to speak. Take a moment. Why don't you just stand up if, if you can, stretch a little bit, and turn around and say hi to the person behind you. All right. I'm going to invite you to go ahead and find your seat, find your spot. We'll reel it in here, okay? The, the welcome time, it's always the time when the extroverts get really excited and the introverts start sweating. And they're like, oh my goodness, I gotta say hello to people. But we are so glad that you're with us today. We are very glad you're with us today. Listen, this, uh, this morning we're in the middle of a series on leadership. We're in the middle of a series on leadership. Last week, Pastor Jim spoke on the message, Lead Like Philip. We looked at Philip the Evangelist. Um, in the early church, and how uh, through, through tragedy, he was sent out, kind of, but into Samaria, into a culture that wasn't his, where he was able to help establish the church there as an evangelist. Um, it was a really encouraging message. Next week is our leadership conference, and we have an amazing pastor, leader, speaker, Ken Dick, joining us, and he's going to be leading us in this Why Not Me leadership conference. It's going to be a fantastic time. Um, if you haven't had a chance to register yet, Go ahead and do that. Listen, if you're like, I keep forgetting to register, and you know you're not going to remember later, get your phone out right now. I'm not going to be offended. Go on the website and register. You can register in the first five minutes of this service, and it's free. No, it's not. I'm just kidding. But go ahead and register, um, and we want to see you there. It's going to be a great conference. It's a Friday night, a Saturday morning, and Sunday at church. Well, as I was thinking about leadership this week, I looked up some fun and inspirational quotes on leadership, and I wanted to share a few of these with you. So here's the first one. When troubles arise and things look bad, there is always one individual who perceives a solution and is willing to take command. Very often, that person is crazy. It's Dave Barry, an author and a humorist, and uh, it's true. Very often, some of the greatest leaders are also a little strange in the head, and that's okay. Uh, people who enjoy meetings should not be in charge of anything. <laughs> So that's Thomas Sowell, an economist there. And uh, some of us are in the love meeting camp. Some of us are in the not love meeting camp, and that's okay. Um, never underestimate the power of stupid people in large groups. 
That's George Carlin, a comedian. Some of you are like, am I allowed to laugh at that? But uh, listen, 15 years ago on, uh, on Boxing Day, I led a mob into Walmart because they didn't open on time. It was really stupid. But anyways, never underestimate the power of stupid people in large groups. I put myself in that category. Uh, first rule of leadership, everything is your fault, right? It all falls on the leader. Uh, here's one more. Sometimes you have to take a break from being the kind of boss that's always trying to teach people things. Sometimes you just have to be the boss of dancing. Well, that's Michael Scott from the fictional show, The Office. And, uh, you know, if you've never seen The Office, you're like, that makes no sense. If you've seen it, you know exactly what's going on. Uh, he's a bit of a crazy boss. But here's the point. There's no shortage of leadership advice in our world. There is no shortage of leadership advice in our world. I came across the quotes of two former presidents this week that really struck me, not necessarily in a good way, um, but two presidents, one from the U.S., one from Russia, and here they are. Leadership is the art of getting someone else to do something you want done because he wants to do it. We might say he or she wants to do it these days. That's Dwight Eisenhower, former American president. You can build a throne with bayonets, but you can't sit on it for long. That's Boris Yeltsin, a former Russian president. These two quotes speak to what I believe is often the underbelly or the ugly side of leadership, manipulation and power. Manipulation, is it not the art of getting someone else to do something you want because he or she wants to do it, or maybe they feel obliged to do it? Is that not manipulation? Power, building a throne with bayonets. In a lot of the world's leadership, manipulation and power is praised, is raised up, and it's used relentlessly in leadership. But I believe Yeltsin is right when he says you can build a throne with bayonets, but you can't sit on it for long. Manipulation and power will only get you so far and will ultimately hurt both you and those who you lead. Well, what about you? Let's move away from manipulation and power for a minute, and let me ask you a question. What is your leadership style? Listen, we are all leaders in various capacities. I know sometimes we go, well, I don't, I don't really think I'm a leader. I don't think of myself that way. But we all lead in three directions. We lead those who are down or below us, not because they're below us, like in that way, sense. But if you've ever worked in customer service, the customers are people that you lead. If you've ever worked in a job where you have a managing role, you're leading. If you've ever been the boss or you are the boss, you're leading. We all pe lead people below us. We all lead people across from us. We all have friends, we have relationships, we have spouses, we have peers, and we all lead across, which we influence those relationships, and they influence us, and hopefully we move and use our leadership across in a good way. And we all lead up. We all have bosses, we all have leaders, we all have coaches, we all have people above us. And the way we lead up is by leading well below, we can help make their life easier. We can help them be better leaders. So whether you consider yourself a leader or not, we're all everyday leaders in our workplaces, in our homes, and in life. So what's your leadership style? Maybe you think of yourself as the coach, you know, the coach leadership style. It's the, I believe in you. You can do it. You're a winner. Keep going. You're the best. Some of us are the coach in the room. Or maybe you're the democratic leader. That's the one where it's like, all right, let's just put it to a vote. Everyone put your hand up. Okay, it's about 80%. We're going to make that decision. That's okay. That's a leadership style. Or perhaps you're the charismatic leader. I have arrived in the room, and now all shall do as I see fit, because I'm smiling and I'm charming. Maybe not many of us are the charismatic leader, but you might be raising one. You might be raising one in your household. Or what about the laissez-faire leader? This is the leadership style that says, you know what? Everyone just do what you want. Just make sure the work gets done. I'll be in my office. Let me know how it's going, okay? That's okay. It's a leadership style. Or there's the autocratic leader, the leader who's like, I'm the boss, I've got the best ideas, so everyone just needs to go with what I say because it's going to work out. And that's another style. That's some of us. It's okay. Which one are you? I bet most of us, there's more styles than this, but most of us can probably identify with one of these. And I want to say this. God has wired each of us differently. And I think all of these leadership styles are valid, and they have their spaces in the leadership conversations. But all of these leadership styles could be subject to an overlayer of manipulation and power. I believe this is what the enemy, this is what Satan wants you to embrace in your leadership style. 
When Jesus was tempted in the desert, what did Satan try and do? What did he try and do? He tried to manipulate him and tempt him with power. But there's another option when it comes to having a layer of leadership, a layer that I believe all Christians, regardless of which one of these styles you are, a layer that you must exhibit. And this layer is at odds with the layer of manipulation and power. This is the way of Jesus, servant leadership. It's servant leadership. Check out these words from Jesus in Mark 10. Jesus called them, his disciples together, and said, you know, that, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them? Who were those rulers of the Gentiles that lorded it over them? Do we know? It's the Roman Empire, one of the most ruthless and powerful empires ever known to humanity, who lorded power, conquered people. Jesus says, not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Allow me to pray. Father God, as we get into your word today, Lord, as we get into particularly the life of Mary Magdalene in the New Testament, Lord, I just ask God that you would come and speak to our hearts, Lord. Would you guide us in what it means to be servant leaders, Lord? Would you guide us in what it means to be really uh, um, seeing ourselves as the ones who are here to serve all, not the ones who are to rule and hold power over others? God, would you come and speak to our hearts today? In your name I pray, Jesus. Amen. Regardless um, of leadership styles, when I look at followers of Jesus in the New Testament, there is one name, there's one leader, there's one woman who I believe exhibits servant leadership beyond even the other disciples of Christ. And that's Mary Magdalene. It's Mary Magdalene. Not someone we look at very often in the scriptures. But today, I want to encourage you to lead like Mary and practice servant leadership. We're going to look at a few key examples of servant leadership from Mary's life. So if you have your Bible, you can open up to Luke chapter 8. We're going to be uh, reading right from the start of there. And because we're jumping around the scriptures today, I have put them on the screen as well. So it's up to you if you want to follow in, in your Bible or follow on the screen. Um, but they will be there today. Let's pick up in verse 1. Soon afterward, he, that's Jesus, went on through cities and villages, proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him. It's the twelve disciples. And also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, and Joanna, the wife of Shusa, Herod's household manager, and Susanna, and many others who provided for them out of their means. The first thing we see in the life of Mary is this. Servant leaders lead with their resources. Servant leaders lead with their resources. As, as Jesus started his ministry, he came upon this woman, Mary, and he healed her of seven demons that were afflicting her. And Mary and several other women, they became followers of Jesus in his ministry, right along the 12 disciples. That's what Luke 8 tells us. But they didn't necessarily serve by direct gospel proclamation, at least that's not what we're told in the scriptures. But they did serve in one specific way. Mary provided for the ministry, according to verse 3, out of her means. A few years ago, there was a family that approached Alpha Canada. Alpha, for those of you who might not be familiar, it's an evangelistic ministry. It's global. Millions, over 30 million or 40 million people have heard the gospel, have made decisions for Jesus going to Alpha. And this family approached Alpha Canada, and they said, look, they said, you know, we serve in Alpha in our local church, and we have a heart to see more Alphas happen, but we don't really, it's not, we don't really feel equipped to be the ones who are starting Alphas. But they said, here's what we can do. We own the second largest billboard company in Canada. We have signs on highways and roadways in every major city, and we're willing to donate over a million dollars in advertising if you can coordinate the church in Canada to run an Alpha campaign in the fall. So in 2017 and 2018, that's exactly what happened. Maybe if you think back to then, maybe you were driving around at that time in life and you noticed some of these billboards that were on highway signs, on buses, saying, try Alpha, why Alpha, uh, come out to Alpha. And because of this family and their generous donation, churches, first of all, coordinated for Alpha, but Alpha was also broadcast across our whole country, and many people came to know Christ through those two campaigns. And that's what happened. Now, uh, proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God, it happened in part because one family gave their resources sacrificially to Jesus. 
Here's the point. We all have resources we can give towards ministry. We all have time we can give. We all have talent we can give. And we all have treasure we can give. Time, talent, and treasure. And I believe all of us are called by God to give in some measure of those things. Maybe in some areas more than others. But we all have something to give. Mary was a servant leader and she gave of her treasure. Let's read a bit more about Mary and servant leadership in Luke 10. And we're going to start in verse 38 here. Now, as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she went up to him and said, Lord, you do not care that my sister has left me to serve alone. Tell her to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. The second thing we learn from Mary is this. Servant leaders make time for Jesus. Servant leaders make time for Jesus. Now this is a little side note, but scholars are a bit split on whether or not this Mary in this uh, narrative is the same Mary Magdalene in the rest of scripture. I looked at a lot of articles. I researched it. They're split. If you want to go down the rabbit hole this week and get back to me is what the right answer is, you can do that. But for the sake of our message today, lead like Mary, this Mary exhibits the same servant leadership attitude of Mary of Magdalene. So we're going to roll with it, okay? This account's an interesting one. Martha is doing exactly what a good host does. She's busy making food. She's making sure the house is nice. She's showing hospitality. She's there for her gifts. She's serving. She's busy serving. Isn't that the definition of a servant leader? A person who is serving? But in the midst of doing things for Jesus, there's something we can all miss as servant leaders. Spending time with Jesus. Let me ask you a few questions. What does your weekly devotional rhythm look like? Not rhetorical. I mean, you can a- don't answer out loud. But really, when do you take your quiet time with the Lord? Really answer that. Do you have a rhythm? Do I have a devotional rhythm? I'm not asking the question to make you feel bad or to make you feel good. I'm simply asking, are you so busy serving others, serving the church, serving your work, serving your family, that you're not making time for the one who teaches us how to serve, our great servant leader, Jesus? If you want to learn to be a servant leader, you have to learn from the best. You have to learn from Jesus. You have to sit at his feet. Servant leaders make time for Jesus. Here's the third thing we learn about servant leadership from Mary Magdalene. The context of these passages are at the cross of Jesus on the day he died. And I'm going to read them out of my notes here because we're going to jump around in a few passages. Matthew 27 says, There were also many women there, looking on from a distance, who had followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him, among whom were Mary Magdalene, and Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, and, Ma- and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. Mark 15 says, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. And Luke 23 says, the women who had come with him from Galilee followed, and they saw the tomb and how his body was laid. Now you might be going like, okay, what's the point? Why are we reading this? Here's the thing. In all four accounts of Jesus' death, it's clearly stated that the women who were the disciples of Jesus stayed at the cross and went above and beyond to ensure they knew where Jesus was taken. They knew exactly where Jesus was laid. Do you know who wasn't around? All the boys. All the male disciples. They're the ones who weren't around. Here's the third thing we learned from Mary about servant leadership. Servant leaders don't run. Servant leaders don't run. When Jesus was feeding the 5,000, there were many with him. In certain generations in church history, and in some cultures even today, Jesus is quite popular. It's easy to follow Jesus when everyone's following Jesus, isn't it? When Jesus went into Jerusalem, he had a following. But as that week unfolded, he was arrested. His name was marred by the Sadducees and the religious leaders. More and more people ran from Jesus. They didn't want to be associated. It wasn't popular anymore. When Jesus was arrested, his own disciples, such as Peter, denied him. They were afraid for their own lives. We know that only one of the 12 male disciples seems to have been at the cross, and that's John, Jesus' best friend. 
But in all the accounts, we see the female disciples of Jesus. We see that Mary Magdalene did not run. They were brave for their Lord in the face of adversity. And not only did they not run, but they followed to make sure they knew exactly where Jesus was laid. They might, no one might have not even known where Jesus was if it hadn't have been for Mary and these women who knew exactly where Jesus was. My parents uh, attended a church for 40 years, and they raised my brothers and I in that church. And most of those years were really exciting years, really great years for the church, a gospel proclamation always. But when I was a kid, I remember there were, was a rough patch in the church. Attendance was down, people were leaving, and my parents, they weren't leaders in the church, they weren't prominent or anything like that, they were just faithful, everyday Christians. And I remember when many people were leaving, and even uh, um, we as a family were being invited to check out other churches. I remember one day my dad, we were at home, and he put his foot down and said to us as a family, he said, this is our church. He said, as long as they preach the gospel, we aren't going anywhere. We've been with them in the good times, and we'll stick with our church in the hard times. That stuck with me. Servant leaders don't run. They stay faithful to the Lord and what he's called them to in every situation, in every season. It's not to say there aren't times when God calls you to a different church as well, folks. But in the hard times, we don't run. Servant leadership isn't about what's best for me. It's about what's best for the kingdom. Mary didn't run. Well, here's the fourth thing we learn about servant leadership from Mary. You see, Mary had been monitoring the tomb 24-7. Maybe she was one of the only ones who actually heard Jesus say he would be lifted up on the third day. I don't know. But on the third day, she sees the stone rolled away, and she meets Jesus. And here's how the account goes in John chapter 20, starting in verse 15. Jesus said to her, "'Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking?' Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've laid him, and I will take him away. It's devotion. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabbanai, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, um, to my God and to your God. And this verse isn't on the screen, but it says, Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the risen Lord, and that he had said these things to her. The fourth thing we learn is this. Servant leaders go wherever Jesus sends. Servant leaders go wherever Jesus sends. Mary has been with Jesus every step of the way. In terms of sticking with her Lord to the end, she has been more faithful and more loyal than all the other disciples. There's no place she'd rather be than with her Lord. But when Jesus says, go and tell the others, she goes. So often in scripture, leaders don't listen to God. Moses didn't want to lead at the burning bush. Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh. Abraham and Sarah doubted God's promises. Solomon intermarried with other other people, even though God's commanded him not to. I have a friend named Joel. A few years ago, uh, Joel was getting on an airplane for a flight related to work and hops on the airplane. Um, Airplane takes off into the sky and within about five minutes of being in the sky, um, something's happening at the front. The flight attendants come on and they say, "Uh, is there a doctor or a medical person on the plane? Is there a doctor or medical person on the plane? No one moves, no one puts their hand up. She said, we have a man up here He's uh, had some type of issue, we don't know, cardiac arrest, stroke, he's not breathing, he's unconscious, and his eyes are closed. We need a doctor or a medical person right now. We're trying to, we have to re- reland the plane, we need someone. And uh, Joel, Joel's like, not a doctor or a medical person at all. Uh, he's a former actor and he's in ministry now, but um, he's, he's kind of sitting there looking around and no one's responding. And so finally, uh, Joel starts to hear in his heart God saying something to him. He hears God saying, Joel, you have something to offer. And he's like, uh, I grew up Baptist. Like, we don't do that. You know, like, we pray for healing from a distance. <laughs> and God's like, no, 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 no. You're not praying for me for healing from a distance. You need to go and pray for this man. And so uh, Joel was like feeling very uncomfortable, but he kind of puts his hand up and he says to the flight attendant, he says, I'm not a medical person. He's like, but I am a Christian, and I'd be happy to come up and pray for this man. Can I do that? And uh, the, the flight attendant's like, hey, it's not going to hurt, right? So come on up. So Joel kind of slinks his way to the front, lays his hand on this 
man who's unconscious, not breathing, unresponsive, lying there. And he just starts to pray out loud, in the mighty name of Jesus, would this man be healed? In the mighty name of Jesus, would this man come back to life? Jesus, come and heal this man. Jesus, come and uh, bring life to this man. Jesus, bring breath to this man. Well, as Joel's praying, there were about three or four other Christians who were on the plane. And uh, because of his example, they came forward and they began to pray, Jesus, would you heal this man? Jesus, would you do something amazing for the kingdom? They prayed for one minute, two minutes, three minutes, and suddenly, <gasps> The man came back to life. He started breathing. His eyes opened. Yeah, praise God. It's amazing. And he was was obviously still somewhat in distress. His breath had come back and whatnot. By this time, the plane was landing on the tarmac, and uh, they didn't get a big chance to really interact a lot with the man. He got whisked away, um, and then the plane took back off into the sky. Well, Joel had some of the most amazing gospel conversations on that plane after that moment passengers all around him wanted to know what's going on like what just happened there one of the flight attendants sat with him for an hour and he was just able to share his faith and testimony with them it's an amazing miracle Joel by his own admission he didn't want to step out in faith and pray for this man's healing he was terrified but Joel's a servant leader and servant leaders like Joel today like Mary Magdalene of old they go wherever Jesus sends They go wherever Jesus sends. I have one bonus point here, and then we're going to close this out this morning. And here's the bonus point. Servant leaders shift paradigms. Servant leaders shift paradigms. You know, in the biblical examples of servant leadership in the life of Mary Magdalene, the four passages we looked at, I want you to consider how Mary Magdalene, a female disciple, flipped the script on certain expectations of women in her day. Mary sat at Jesus' feet, Or sorry, Mary, first of all, financially supported the work of Jesus. That was not expected of women in this society. This was a much more patriarchal society where men did the work of earning the money and whatnot, and women took care of kids and took care of the home. And listen, there's nothing wrong with how we break that down in our households. But Mary flipped the script. The scripture says she was the one that resourced the ministry of Jesus. Jesus' ministry might not have taken off if it weren't for a faithful woman like Mary. Mary sat at Jesus' feet. This was not expected of uh, women in this society. Jesus was a rabbi. He had male disciples who followed him around, listened to his teaching. Yet when Mary goes and sits at Jesus' feet, just like one of those male disciples would do, what does Jesus do? Does he say, go away, go help your sister Martha? No, he affirms her. He says, Mary has done what's right. Mary is the one who is doing what's right here. Mary uh, and the women, they were courageous ones. They were the courageous disciples at the cross. This wasn't expected of women in their society. Jesus actually had a disciple, Simon the Zealot. The Zealots were the one who fought the Romans, like literally fought the Romans. He was nowhere to be seen. Yet here was Mary and the women flipping the script at the cross, dedicated to Jesus. And last, Mary was the one who saw the risen Jesus. Listen, in those days, women's eyewitness testimony was discounted. If people wanted to make up the Bible, they would have put Peter or John or someone there as the eyewitness. But those guys were nowhere to be seen. It was Mary who faithfully was there and saw the risen Lord. And it's her name that's recorded as a powerful testimony to the truth of the gospel because we know that if it was a lie, it wouldn't have been Mary. It wasn't a lie. It was Mary. And she was flipping the script on, um, on those gender stereotypes in her day. Women, God might be calling you to shift some paradigms, to break some glass ceilings, to lead in ways you never imagined. And this is where the layer of servant leadership is so important. Because the world's way says shift those paradigms using any means necessary. Use the layers of manipulation and power. I challenge you not to break paradigms with manipulation and power in the world's way. Break paradigms in the way of Mary. Prideful leaders create the vision. Servant leaders build bridges and inspire generations. And listen, everyone, regardless of our gender, God might be calling any of us to shift paradigms. Maybe you sometimes feel, I'm not good enough. I don't have the right education. I don't have the Canadian experience or the experience in general. How could I be used that way? If you're humble enough to think you can't do it, you're exactly the person God wants to use. Put on the layer of servant leadership and lead with integrity, courage, and character. 
Get out there and break some paradigms in Jesus' name. Lead like Mary. So what do we do with this? More than anything today, I hope that God's word, Mary's example, has challenged you to practice servant leadership. Everyone's a leader. We all lead up. We all lead across. We all lead down. We all have a leadership style. The challenge is to put on the layer of servant leadership in all the areas God's called us to lead in. Is God calling you to resource the church? How might you serve with your time, your talent, or your treasure? Is God asking you to spend more time with him at his feet? What are you going to do this week to make sure you're sitting at the feet of Jesus, even before you serve Jesus? Are you in a season where you need to stand firm and not run from a situation where everything in you wants to run? What does having courage to not run look like in your situation? Or maybe it's the opposite. Maybe Jesus is asking you to go, and you're dragging your feet. Will you be the servant leader and follow his call? And last, will you trust that in humility, God can use you to break the broken, par- or to break the broken paradigms of the world for his glory? I'm going to invite our worship team to come up at this point. And I'm going to finish with this. Church, if we can grow in our leadership, if we can grow as servant leaders, we will see Jesus move mightily uh, in mighty ways in our church, in our homes, and in our communities. When you raise your level of servant leadership, you inspire servant leadership in all those who you have influence on. Next weekend is our Why Not Me Leadership Conference. It's a Friday night. It's a Saturday morning. It's Sunday at church. I believe a little time invested can have a massive difference in our leadership. If you want to get serious about growing in your leadership, be sure to join us next weekend for the conference. Lead like Philip, lead like Mary, and ask yourself, why not me? Allow me to pray for us. Father God, I just thank you, Lord, that you are so good, Lord, um, that you've called each of us to be uh, leaders in our respective places of influence, Lord. Uh, Whether we perceive that as being um, not very big or whether we perceive that as being a huge thing, God, you've called us. You've called us to be leaders, Lord. God, you've designed each of us to lead with different leadership styles, and that's beautiful, and that's okay, and that's valid, Lord. But it can be so tempting to put on manipulation, put on power, put on my way or the highway, in what, however we lead, God. I ask, God, that we wouldn't uh, fall into that temptation, Lord, just as you resisted Satan in the 40 days of temptation, God. May we resist Satan when he tries to use our leadership for manipulation and power. But God, may we, like Mary Magdalene of old, put on uh, the layer of servant leadership, God. May we not seek to be first. May we not seek to have our own secret agenda, God, but may we only seek to have your agenda in mind, God. And may we learn to serve like you, the great servant leader. It's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Oh
draws near and my time has come still my soul will sing your praise unending ten thousand years and then forever Amen and amen. Um, we have our two prayer teams here on either side. If you want to be prayed for, please, please come up. Um, anything you've heard today, um, uh, anything that's touching your heart that you'd like to be prayed for, come up and these prayer teams would love to pray with you. Have a great week, everybody. Enjoy the week. There's coffee out in the lobby. Please enjoy each other's company.